Welcome to Bald Guy DIY. In this video, I'm going to show you how to store variables into the internal flash memory of the ESP32 microcontroller so that power failures and reboots of the microcontroller will no longer erase all your variable values. As you know, if you've been following the series I've been doing on ESP32 projects, you can tell that I'm building towards a pan, tilt, zoom video camera setup and today I realized one of the important stepping stones is that I need to be able to save variable values to the internal flash memory of the ESP32 microcontroller so that I can retrieve them later even if the power has been reset or the individual microcontroller has been rebooted using the enable button. In this video I'm going to show you how you can both write values to the internal memory and how you can retrieve them in order to use them on any basic project or even something advanced and then I'll also show you how it applies to storing positions for my pan tilt zoom camera so that I can move easily from one stored position to the next. Without further ado, let's get started. As we look at the specifications here for the internal flash memory of the ESP32, we find out that it is what we call an EEPROM or electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. That's quite a mouthful. What it basically means is that it's possible to read the values that are stored there and it's also possible to overwrite them, but it's not meant to be done as frequently as it would be to something like uh, RAM memory, which is constantly read and overwritten but these are, instead for this, it's meant to be read and referenced regularly, but not meant to be overwritten as many times. There are 256 address locations, though they're actually labeled 0 to 255, which is important to realize, and each address can store a value between 0 and 255. The internal flash memory can be read almost an infinite number of times, but it can only be overwritten approximately 10,000 to 100,000 times. Now that might sound like a lot that you're never gonna hit, but for example, but if you set up your code to overwrite the values in the flash memory every second, you would only get about 27 hours of operation before you've exceeded 100,000 rewrites, in which case the flash memory may no longer be reliable. So as you're writing code, you want to limit it in order to store and save those values as infrequently as possible and to reference them and read them as many times as you need. Let's look at the basic minimum requirements that you need in order to read and write to this EEPROM memory. The first thing you need to do is include the EEPROM library and to find the size of the EEPROM, which is going to be the number of address locations that you're using. The EEPROM library is built into the ESP32 uh, driver database, and so you don't need to download any new libraries. Under the setup loop, we're going to initialize the serial monitor just for the sake of observation or demonstration. And then we do need to initialize the EEPROM itself by using the function EEPROM begin and including the EEPROM size, or again, the number of addresses that we're going to write to. In the loop, we're simply going to read the current value of the zero address, and we're gonna copy it to the stored X variable, and then we're going to print out the value of X, which we start at zero, and then the value of the stored X value. I created a little function here, and we're simply going to use the X value as a counter. It's gonna keep stepping up uh, by one every time, but here it's going to use a little if statement that says that as it's counting up every time by one, if it reaches a state where x divided by 5 equals a remainder of 0 and x is greater than 0, so it's not going to do it initially, then it's going to write the value of x to the stored memory and it's going to save it. The next time through, it's going to read that stored value and you'll see here as I start to run it that the original value of all of these addresses is always 255 and then as the x value counts up, the current value of x counts up by one. Every time it hits a value that's divisible by five, it stores that value, and then you can see the stored value of x is always an even multiple of five. As it cycles through the 40s, you can see. The super cool thing about these stored values is if you're to push the reset or enable button on the ESP32, it'll show you that the stored value is retrieved. So in this case, 50, and then as my counter goes, it'll change the value at five, change the value at 10, 15, etc. But the first value that it read was the one that had been stored even before the power was lost to the device. There again, I can do it with 25. Anywhere that I decide to stop, that latest value of the stored 
stored X will be retrieved the next time the ESP32 is powered on. That's the most powerful thing for the sake of what I'm doing with my pan tilt zoom. I want the locations that I've stored, those hot buttons or stored positions to be retrievable even if the power has been lost to the device or if it's been reset. The next step was to add four push buttons to the microcontroller that has the joystick directly, the sender, in order to have the one on the left be the program button and the three on the right be the individual stored position. Show you what that code looks like. It's basically going to set four values for the four pins that are being used. And I also set a button state variable, which is defaulted as one, which means unpressed for the inputs that are pulled up. And then gonna declare simply here the pin mode of each of those as being pulled up so that one is not pressed and zero is pressed. I begin the serial monitor again to be able to see that our buttons are working correctly. And then in the loop, I'm simply going to read the value of each of those pins into their assigned variables. And then I'm going to print all of those out so that we can see on the screen uh, what the current value of all of those buttons is, whether they're being pressed or not. If you pull up the serial monitor, you can see by default the value of all of them is one, but if I press them individually, you can see they change to zero. That tells you that the buttons are pressed. If I hold program in one, both of those go to zero, program in two, both of those go to zero, etc. Now when I copy that code into my sender, you can see here I'm simply going to declare the same variables and then I'm going to add them to my structure message from the last video I did, which showed you how to send those variables using the ESP now protocol. I need to come to the setup loop and declare all of those pins as inputs. And then I need to come down to the loop function and scroll down to the bottom here where I'm going to declare all of my variables like I did before, except I have to change them to match the format of the structure message. So joystick.program sw instead of just program sw. And it's simply going to read all of the states of those pins into those variables and send them off to the receiving code. If we look at the receiving code, it's the same as I used last time for the ESP now receiver. But once again, I need to add new variables for the sake of the three stored positions that I'm going to use. On the receiver side, I'm going to store a variable for each, the pan and the tilt at each location so that they can be sent to the servo to write those different locations. And so I'm simply going to have a position one pan, a position one tilt, position two pan, position two tilt, etc. If I scroll down here to the structure message, it has to match the sending message in order for that to be received properly. And as you can see, once again, all of the actual instructions that we're going to carry out are done on the on data receive. When that mem copy command happens, you can see here, if you scroll down, that the programming position one is calculated by when I hold the program button down, and then I also hold button one, it's going to store the current position of both servos to my variables, and it's going to save them to the EEPROM. If I simply just press the position one without pressing the program, it's instead going to write the position one values to the pan and tilt servos, and it's going to cause it to move to that location. For position two and for position three, these are simply repetitions, but just using the different variables for position two and position three. And then finally, I'm going to print out all of the locations just for the sake of troubleshooting. Now, if you look here at the serial monitor, it's a little bit hard to watch, but that first little section here, as I show, is the current position of the servos. As I move the joystick, I get them to the position that I want. And then if I want to lock in that value in that first line, which is position one, I simply hold the program button and the position one button, and you'll see it switch to the current position. It now becomes 143 and 99, just like the current position of those servos. If I want to store another position, I simply just move it to that location, hold the program button and then press the button that I want to assign it to. It works super slick. As I push the buttons, the servos are written to those correct positions and the pan and tilt mechanism moves to those stored locations. If we take a look at the actual device, here I'm using it under joystick control so it's nice and slow and smooth the way that I originally designed it. And then as soon as I push those macro buttons or those stored positions, you can see that it snaps to those locations very quickly and exactly the same position every single time as I cycle through those buttons. In the future, I'll make that motion a lot smoother, but for now, it's a success. So now you can see how to use stored and retrieved values from the flash memory on both basic projects and on something a little more advanced like my PTZ camera project. With these microcontrollers, so often we're not really using the full capability of them. And so the internal flash memory a lot of times gets ignored, but 
in this case, you can see how to use it if you need it and just enable one more feature that you can use on all of your projects to come. If you like these kind of videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. Give them a like so I can tell what resonates with people the most and come back often as I post a new video every Saturday morning. If you have a question or a comment, feel free to leave it in the comments below or send me an email or follow me on Twitter. My information is in the description below. That's all for this video and hopefully in just a few more videos we'll have the finished pan tilt zoom video camera contraption all finished up. Until next time in all your DIY projects whether you're right or red don't be afraid to be balder.